All right, what experiment are we doing tomorrow? Two. Experiment two is uh, calorimetry. Hess's law, we haven't talked about Hess's law yet, but you don't have to worry about it. Uh, calorimetry, um, mm -hmm. yeah, earthquake. Uh, the, tomorrow's going to be a busy day because we have that earthquake drill, and um, I want to try to finish the entire lab tomorrow. It's, it's scheduled over two days, but the first day I want to collect the data, and the second day we're going to go work up the data and do the calculations. And so the, we have the earthquake drill. Hopefully it won't take more than 30 minutes. And so tomorrow there's going to be no discussion. You're going to go straight into lab and, and start working. Okay. And so... Uh, and try to finish. Uh, well, we're going to use, there, there's going to be a little bit of discussion because we have a LabQuest system. Uh, LabQuest is just a data acquisition system. It's really uh, pretty easy to set up. And so when you guys um, start it, we'll, we'll just set it up together. It just takes a minute. And um, what we're going to do is uh, use a calorimeter. What is a calorimeter? Well, you know, a calorimeter we use to measure, you know, if our system is absorbing heat, you know, then, um, you know, the surroundings, that heat's coming from the surroundings, but what we do is we just say the calorimeter or whatever else, calorimeter to keep the surroundings simpler because this, the surroundings actually consist of what? The entire universe, right? And the entire universe is a messy thing and it's going to be complicated in, in any type of calculation. And so to kind of isolate this from the rest of the universe, we use a calorimeter. And the calorimeter is kind of insulated in some ways and so we don't have too much leakage out into the lab. And so calorimeter or calorimeter plus other stuff, you know. is typically what we have. And uh, usually it's calorimeter plus other stuff. This is gonna be our surroundings. And so what the calorimeter does is it just makes the, um, you know, <coughs> excuse me, measurement of heat input into the system a lot easier. And the same thing here, any heat that the system absorbs is gonna come from the calorimeter plus other stuff. Now the calorimeter is controlled, you know, and so, if we have the uh, control like this, then um, you know we aren't subject to the variations in, in each lab. And the same thing, if there's heat output, we're going to output that heat into you know the calorimeter in whatever else plus other. And so the calorimeter kind of con contains things and, and controls things. So this is going to be our system, and our surroundings will be the. Uh, calorimeter. All right, sometimes it's just a calorimeter alone, sometimes it's a calorimeter plus whatever products or whatever stuff, other stuff we have remaining. So, what is the calorimeter? Um, well, we have two types of calorimeters, you know. One um, calorimeter is for a constant volume. And so a constant volume calorimeter is what we call a bomb calorimeter. And what you do is any kind of heat, usually you're going to do some exothermic reactions. So let's say heat is given off. Q. This would be our system here. Typically, we'll have a reaction occurring here, you know, some kind of chemical reaction. And so our, our, our system is some reaction. This reaction is giving off heat. The heat is going into the bomb calorimeter. That way, we don't have to, to factor in the entire rest of the universe. We'll just say that the bomb pretty much is going to contain that heat. It's not really an isolated system, but in, a, in another way, it is an isolated system. You know, it's not perfectly insulated because heat eventually will leak out from the bomb. 
into the, into the room. But you know, for the most part, the bomb is going to contain the heat. And so the Q of the surroundings, you know, we have Q of the system. Q of the system is equal to Q of the reaction. Okay, what's the surroundings in this case? The surroundings is gonna be very simple because Q of the surroundings is equal to Q of the bomb. And um, when we're looking at an object like a bomb, right? A bomb is going to depend on the amount of bombs we have. Well, we only have one bomb times C times delta T. And so amount is just one, so Q of the bomb is equal to the heat capacity of the bomb in joules per degree C. You know, the units for the heat capacity of the bomb are always the same because we're only using one. It's joules per degree C or kilojoules per degree C, depends on how big the bomb is or whatever else. And so <clears throat> the bomb is gonna absorb a certain amount. This has to be calibrated first. So, you know, each bomb has a different heat capacity because it depends on how much metal you use and what other components you have. Okay, but it's gonna be pretty heavy duty. And there's usually water around here to help as a heat sink, help contain the heat, etc fans, thermal equilibrium, because this needs to reach rapid thermal equilibrium. When we have Q of the reaction, Q of the reaction is different. Remember what Q of the reaction is? It's going to be amount times what? Let's see how much you remember. Amount times what? You know, the thermo is one of those things, you know, how, how long does it take you to memorize stuff? Well, if you're pretty fast, then you're okay, but if you're slow, then you're in trouble because you haven't started memorizing, have you? For the next test. Although short-term memory, you can cram a lot of stuff into your short-term memory and just quickly forget it after, after the test. But, you know, you reach a certain limit there's too much stuff, not enough capacity for your short-term memory. And so what is it? Well, you know, it's amount times delta U. Actually, I don't have that much time because I need to go through a lot today. Okay, and this is for constant volume, of course. Now, for constant pressure, uh, our, our calorimeter is going to look a little different. For constant pressure, um, this is what we call the bomb calorimeter. What we're going to use for constant pressure is the coffee cup calorimeter. And that's what we're using tomorrow. Tomorrow we're doing a constant pressure. Uh, because the coffee cup calorimeter is literally made out of coffee cups, styrofoam cups. We're going to double insulate these. So we're going to put two styrofoam cups here to help you know, prevent too much heat from escaping out. And then we're going to double lid this. So we use two lids. <clears throat> and so double insulated coffee cup. But um, what do you think? Is heat going to leak out? Yeah, heat's going to leak out. So we have to calibrate this. We have to calibrate it to compensate for all that heat leaking out. And so as this coffee cup system absorbs heat, you know, what is the temperature change? Well, the temperature change is usually going to be dictated by what, you know, solution we have in here. Usually we have a product solution because oftentimes we do a reaction. So if we have a product solution here, you know, the product solution as it absorbs heat from our system, you know, so Q is going to be coming in here, Q, Q, you know, Q. Our system's releasing heat. Now, what's going to absorb that heat? Whatever's left over. So, product solutions left over, the coffee cups, and then we have a, a probe in here, a temperature probe. It's called a thermocouple. And the thermocouple is, <clears throat> takes advantage of an electrical signal. You know, you put two different metals in there, and depending on the temperature, it generates a different voltage. The um, the metal is a bimetallic thermocouple and is encased in stainless steel here. So we don't have to worry too much about breaking this. It's pretty sturdy. And then the, there's an electric cord that runs off here to some um, measuring device. 
And so anyway, uh, what, we, what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to calibrate this to see, you know, how much does this assist this coffee cup, thermocouple, lid, air, rest of the universe warm up? You know, depending on how much heat was evolved. All right, so that's, um, that's how we're going to measure heat input or heat output from our system. Uh, so tomorrow, what, what we're going to do is we're going to do a series of experiments. And the first experiment tomorrow, uh, is we're, the purpose of the first experiment is to calibrate the calorimeter. So calibration of calorimeter is first. And the way we can do it, there are lots of different ways we can do it, but um, the, the, uh, the way we're going to do this is backwards from the procedure as written. Uh, in the procedure, all we're going to do is mix hot water and cold water. We mix hot water and cold water. But the procedure says to pour the hot water into the cold. I, I don't like that. Uh, the reason I don't like that is because as you're pouring it, what's going to happen to the hot water as you pour it through air? It cools down. And so heat escapes. Heat escapes into the air, but we want the heat to be captured in the calorimeter, not in the air. And so instead of pouring the hot water into the cold, what we're going to do is we're going to pour the cold water into the hot. If we pour the cold water into the hot, we aren't going to have as big of an error associated with that. And so this is our system. Originally, our system is defined as the hot water. The hot water cools down, gives off heat. It's going to give off heat to the cold water plus the coffee cups. But what we're going to do is we're going to call our system the cold water. And so our system is going to be um, 50.0 grams of uh, cold water. Now, the cold water, we'll just say at T cold. I don't know what the room temperature is. Okay. And then we're, we're going to end up here at 50.0 grams of H2O liquid at T, what we call mix, the mix temperature. It's going to be, you know, tepid water or something something between. And what's going to happen is our system is going to absorb energy. Uh, what's the change here? Is it the change in terms of kinetic potential or both? This is a change just in kinetic energy. This is a hot object warms up. And so heat is going to be input here. Where's that heat coming from? That heat is going to come from our surroundings. Now, how much heat is going to be input? Well, we know when we're dealing with an object, Q is equal to what? Q is equal to, this system is equal to the amount times C times delta T. Now, all that heat is coming from the surroundings. So what is the surroundings going to consist of? The surroundings is going to consist of this. What we're going to do is we're going to put in um, 50.0 grams of hot water, and so H2O liquid at, this is going to be up here, 50.0 grams, it's hot, so it's higher energy, H2O liquid at T hot, T sub H. And so you, you heat it up, you're going to heat it up to like 80 degrees C, All right? But the, as soon as you remove it from the hot plate, it's going to start cooling down, right? And so, you, you, you know, what is the hot temperature? Is it stable? No, it's going to rapidly cool, right? And so, what is this tea hot? The, the tea cold is stable because it's just room temperature, right? Tea cold is stable, but, but tea hot is not stable. And so, what is the temperature? You know, by the time you remove it off the hot plate, you put it in a grad cylinder, you have 50 milliliters, 50.0 milliliters, and then you pour it into a coffee cup, how much has it cooled down by then? So you remove it off the hot plate, measure 50 mils, pour it into a styrofoam cup, and then place the lid. How much has it cooled down by then? A lot. 
It's cooled down a lot. And so how do we know what the temperature is when we mix it? Well, we got a thermometer in there. But even though the thermometer is in there, we measure the temperature, and then 30 seconds later, is it going to be at the same temperature? No, it's not going to be at the same temperature. And so this is why um, we're going to do something more. We're going to monitor the temperature with time. Have you ever heard of Newton's law of cooling? Newton's law of cooling says that the, the temperature drop follows a mathematical pattern. Right? That's Newton's law of cooling, this mathematical pattern. And is that a linear drop in temperature or a nonlinear drop in temperature? What do you think? It's nonlinear because the hotter it is, the faster it cools down. As it approaches room temperature, it cools down slowly. And so what we see is a nonlinear cooling pattern. What we're going to do is we're going to try to determine what that is, but we aren't, we aren't going to use any math. What we're going to do is we're just going to graph it. You know? And so what we have to do is this. What, what we're going to do is we're going to heat up the water on a hot plate, measure it out, pour it into a styrofoam cup, double insulated, put the lid on, put the thermocouple in, and then watch the temperature for how many minutes? We're going to watch the temperature for like five minutes, just watching, you know, in the cup, how is that cooling down? And so what we do here is we'll just mark it at T0. You know, T hot is here. This is in the cup with the thermocouple. So we have 50 grams of hot water in here. And so time zero, whenever that is, and then one minute later, where is it? And then one minute later, where is it? And then one minute later, where is it? And so we're going to monitor it for like five minutes, and then um, this should give us a nice cooling curve. You know, it's stable because it's now double insulated. We should see a nice cooling curve, right? Okay, then once we have this cooling curve, we can predict, you know, because at minutes, I think at minute six, we want to pop the lid and then pour in our cold water. We aren't actually going to take a measurement at minute six because you know, minute six, we're pouring in the water, cold water. And so we don't have an actual temperature. Well, we are going to have an actual temperature here. You know, we're going to have an actual temperature here, but that temperature is wrong because that temperature is usually like air. You know, the thermocouple doesn't stop reading because we're going to program it into the LabQuest system. And so we pop the lid. When we pop the lid, then the temperature is going to change, of course, so we ignore this. And so what we're looking for is what we call a cooling curve. This cooling curve is we just draw the best fit for this curve so we can extrapolate what the temperature should have been at minute six. The temperature should have been here had the thermocouple been in there, but it's not going to be in there because we're going to pop the lid. Does that make sense? Yes? Although, we, for the room temperature water, the room temperature could be colder out of the tap. So it might warm up a little bit or it might be warmer out of the tap. We don't know. So what we're going to do is we're also going to monitor the cold water as well. And so as we monitor the cold water, we want to see, is it stable? Probably. And so we're going to have a second styrofoam cup here with the cold water. And we're just going to monitor it for five minutes to see. I think it was five minutes. I got to look back at that experiment. Do we mix it five or do we mix it six? Somebody read it yet? Nobody's read it. Okay. Well, five or six. Just say that. And then, um, obviously, we're we're going to have a temperature here. Usually, the temperature pops up because the air is usually a little warmer here. And so these two, you know, are just garbage readings here. And so what we do is we're going to extrapolate this curve out here and get the actual temperature here. And so the thermocouples are going to have um, misleading temperatures because they aren't actually in the water. 
This one's measuring air, this one's measuring whatever. Okay, then what I do is I take my cold water, my system, and then pour it into my hot water. And so I'll pop the lid here and pour this into the hot. And so what's gonna happen? What's gonna happen is there's going to be heat transfer. Now what is hot? Well, I have hot water in this cup. And so the water is hot, but there's something else that's hot. What else is hot? The cup itself. In other words, the calorimeter. And so the, the, the hot water is not alone here. We're going to have 50.0 grams of H2O liquid at T hot plus the calorimeter at T hot. And so we have hot water and hot calorimeter. The hot water and hot calorimeter is going to give heat to the cold water. And the hot water and the hot calorimeter are going to cool down to T-mix. And so what the calorimeter does is calorimeter just pretty much contains oops, the rest of the universe for us, you know, in a more manageable uh, system. I mean, our surroundings, more manageable surroundings to be correct. And so the hot water and calorimeter cool down, the cold water warms up. Now we don't know, you know, how much uh, heat does that calorimeter lose? Do you know? I, we don't know that. And so what we're going to do is um, we're going to use this because we know if we can measure the mixed temperature, but the problem is, do we actually measure the temperature at the time of mixing? No, because mixing takes time. Mixing is a slow process because of liquid diffusion. And so mixing is actually kind of a slow process. That is, if you pour hot water into a cold bathtub, you know, does it mix instantly? And you have the mixed temperature, it's homogeneous throughout, or is it heterogeneous? That is, there are heat gradients. What do you think? No, there are going to be heat gradients. In other words, it's going to take some time mixing. So immediately when you pour it, you want to leave the lid off minimum, right? Because we don't want too much heat to escape because the calorimeter is trying to contain it, right? And so we're going to pop the lid off here, pour the water, and quickly close it, and use the thermocouple to stir it and swirl it with our hands because we want it to mix as rapidly as possible, but unfortunately we can't get it to mix. And so we don't actually know what the temperature is at the time of mixing because it's gonna, immediately it's gonna start cooling down. But the thing is we might hit hot spots, we might hit cold spots, we might hit hot spots, but eventually everything will be thoroughly mixed. And so we're going to take this, it says to take it out to um, 11, 12 minutes, but I say take it out to 15 minutes this is different. So there are two differences in this procedure. One, we are pouring the cold into the hot. Two, we're going to collect 15 minutes of total data. We're going to collect 15 minutes of total data so that we're sure that everything's properly mixed. And so these heat, these initial points, we don't weigh as heavily because it's probably due to improper mixing. And so we kind of ignore these initial points, we, right? And once we see this cooling pattern here, what we're going to do is we're going to back extrapolate this. Because this should be a, a, a smooth curve. Because when a liquid cools down, does it jump around? Like you're trying to cool a hot cup of coffee, does the temperature fluctuate up and down, up and down? No. It's going to just cool down gradually, right? And so this is what we're going to have. We're going to back extrapolate this out to six minutes. And so this is what we call T-mix here because we, if we could have mixed it in one instant of time, we would have gotten T mix. And so these are our temperatures here. The temperatures are going to be T hot at the time of mixing, T mix, T mix at the time of mixing is going to be here from extrapolating this curve out backwards, and T cold at the time of mixing. Well, these data we don't have. These data we have to get by graphing it. And we're going to graph it next week. 
on Excel. You just need, I used to have you guys grab it by hand. Uh, I'm just gonna, we'll just grab it by Excel. Is that clear? Maybe, maybe not, but you just read through it and figure it out. Okay, now that we have tea mixed, tea hot, and tea cold, we can do some calculations. So the first calculation is this. And this, this equation is gonna be different, of course, because we're doing it differently than your lab manual. But it's easy to change. Q the system, the system's the cold water, right? And so this is Q cold. The surroundings, the surroundings is the uh, hot water plus the calorimeter. Okay, so Q, the cold, that's an object. So an object depends on the amount times C times delta T. Delta T for the cold. Well, delta T for the cold, uh, actually, well, let's just do this. It's going to be T mix minus T cold. And so it's going to warm up. All right, the hot water is just an object too, so it's going to be the amount times C times delta T of the hot. So this is T final, which is T mix, minus T initial, which is T hot. And then the calorimeter. The calorimeter is just one object, so the amount is 1 times C times delta T. Well, delta T is T mix is the final temperature, T hot was the initial temperature. And so the only unknown we have here is C. And so what we're going to do is we're going to have to calculate the heat capacity of the calorimeter by solving for C. Everybody's going to have a different heat capacity of the calorimeter. Does somebody have their lab manual? No. All right, uh, the next thing we're going to do is uh, ask, I want to ask you this. Was this a constant pressure or constant volume system? Constant pressure, or constant volume. Constant pressure. It's constant pressure, but did the volume change? So we have 50 milliliters plus 50 milliliters. Did the did the volume change? Well, you say yeah, it changed. It went from to 100, but did it really change? No, because we started off with 100 milliliters initial, right? The hot and the cold, and we end up with 100 milliliters total final. So even though this is a constant pressure system, this system's unique in the sense that it doesn't matter if you did this in a bomb or if you did this in a coffee cup, you'd get the exact same results because the volume does not change under constant pressure conditions. Does that make sense? Maybe, maybe not. But that's one of the things you have to understand. Understand thermo. So what are we doing next? Okay. This is out this might be out of order. Um this might be out of order, but it doesn't matter what order you do these in. You could do them in any order you want. But um, the next uh, system we're going to look at is uh, sodium hydroxide dissolution. Do you know what dissolution means? Dissolving. That's what dissolution means. So we're going to dissolve sodium hydroxide. And so our system is going to be a little different. Basically, we have sodium hydroxide solid, 
and we add that to water, and we'll get sodium hydroxide aqueous. But this it turns out to be a highly exothermic um, process. And so we get sodium hydroxide aqueous plus energy. All right, so um, set this up for me. Set this up for me with energy level diagrams. Okay. 